Greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us at Exchanging Ideas 55 Global 5G Evolution. A warm welcome to the great speakers around the global. Thank you for joining us at Exchanging Ideas 55. Uh, I'm Kaneshwaran Gwendasamy, the moderator of this particular uh, program. Uh, to the audience, please take a couple of seconds to click the subscribe button on our YouTube channel. Uh, today will be a very interesting topic uh, that we will discuss during the Q&A. Uh, given the rapid evolution of 5G and its diverse applications, what do you anticipate will be the most promising 5G monetization model in 2025? Which model do you believe will offer the highest potential for revenue gen generation and long-term sustainability? Uh, so to the speakers at the end, uh, we will brainstorm, you know, uh, and, and share some of your greatest ideas, knowledge and experience and how you see the 2025 looks like. Uh, without due delay, um, I would like to present the impact of 5G advance on energy efficiency. I, as an independent um, uh, industry analyst, will give my thoughts on the GSME intelligence uh, particular slide over here. Now, with this uh, energy efficiency, why are we here? With more data being transferred across mobile networks, demand for energy is increasing each year. And this threatens operator energy efficiency and carbon reduction targets. While energy costs are a significant proportion of operators' OPEX, it is also an area with many opportunities for OPEX savings with targeted CAPEX on energy efficiency. And this graph illustrates the increasing demand for cellular connections and mobile data traffic, particularly in 5G networks. And this growing demand underscores the importance of energy efficiency in the cellular industry as it highlights the need to optimize uh, the energy efficiency, which is so crucial, especially considering the potential energy intensity of 5G networks, as indicated by the red color representing the 5G data traffic in the graph. Now, while metrics like kilometer per liter are commonly used to measure fuel efficiency in gasoline-powered powered vehicles, the automotive industry lacks a single universe metric for overall energy efficiency. And this is especially true of uh, EVs and hybrids, where factors like energy consumption, uh, well-to-wheel efficiency, and tailpipe emissions also plays a crucial role in assessing energy performance. And for wireless network, there is no single metric to measure overall energy efficiency as it involves optimizing energy consumptions at various levels, including total co company operations, network infrastructure, and individual cell sites. Considering the importance factors such as power consumption, uh, equipment, cooling systems, data center efficiency to achieve an energy efficient wireless networks. And this is a quick summary on how quickly the access point is changing in these industries. In the 2G, 3G times, we usually had separate shelter with coax cable and amplifier on site up. And then during the 4G times, we started to use more fiber to connect the BBU and the antennas and reuse the shelter into smaller cabinets. And the future vision is virtualized network with a pool of BBU's resources which can be from the site and basically putting everything into the small boxes and reusing the rental costs and the wind load. And with the integration of antenna and RRU and using fiber wherever possible. So we see this is a very rapid change, which is heavily impacting energy efficiency because obviously we don't need different power modules for each of these equipment. Now we highlighted here the different ways of network operators, including the mobile operators or enterprises can improve energy efficiency here. The list side, simplification, physical modernization. Secondly, it's integrated hardware as much. You can using sharing uh, same paramodule coding solutions are critical here, like outdoor equipment placement and passive thermal management. Um, AI and resource optimization helps operators to use the energy resources more efficiently. Uh, incorporating renewable energy sources such as uh, solar power and wind power 
can significantly reduce the carbon footprint of mobile networks and lower operational costs in the long run. So by combining these strategies, mobile network operators can achieve significant energy savings, uh, reduce the environment impact, and lower the operational costs. Now, um, in traditional setup, each band would have its own separate components. Each of these components would um, house its own power module. And by integrating multiple bands into a single unit, multiband radio reduces the number of components, leading to economics of scale. Uh, shared power modules and reduce wind load, rental costs, and maintenance efforts as well. And this ultimately results in a more efficient, cost effective, and simplified mobile network infrastructure. And uh, this slide highlights uh, various cooling solutions for mobile network equipment, focusing on passive cooling techniques uh, by using advanced materials, innovative designs, and high efficiency components. Passive cooling can reduce energy consumption and improve environmental impact, while liquid cooling offers efficient heat dissipation. Its implementation may be limited by local climate conditions. Uh, overall, the combination of these strategies aims to create more sustainable and energy efficient mobile networks. Now, energy efficiency, especially in sectors like data centers and telcos, is high data intensive area. AI can be used to optimize network resources across three domains, time, frequency, and spatial. AI can significantly enhance network efficiency by optimizing resource allocation in the time domain. By analyzing real traffic patterns, AI can intelligently allocate resources like bandwidth and power based on fluctuating demand, ensuring optimal utilization. In frequency domain as new frequency bands like millimeter wave and 5G, uh, introduce the AI further can optimize the usage, ensuring efficient utilization of network resources and reducing the overall uh, energy consumption. So lastly, this slide highlights the benefits of AI-driven power savings in this time domain. While traditional approaches rely on preset capacity, AI can dynamically adjust network capacity and power consumption based on real-time traffic patterns and this leads to significant energy savings by avoiding over-provisioning during low traffic periods. And by aligning resource allocation with actual demand, AI empowers networks to operate more efficiently and uh, sustainably. So I think this is overall my presentation. And uh, let me introduce our next uh, speaker. Thomas Degen from Cologne, Germany, to present on telecommunications metaverse, the telco niche in industrial metaverse. Over to you, Thomas. Yeah, thank you, Kanish. Um, thanks for the introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you are watching this um, session. I'm um, Thomas Degen from um, Aventus AI, and I would like to to go to look at things from a different angle from a different perspective um, and, and I would like to to raise the question about why are we doing these things so why are we are we creating these networks yeah high efficient um, low energy consuming um, why are we we are so proud about the uh, networks that we are creating they are self-operating they are self-healing um, we deploy massive uh, network functions for various aspects and um, we are quite proud that our network infrastructure um, can stand load 7 by 24 with zero downtime but um, why are we doing it and what's um, in advance um, for, for, for the rest of the world and um, let me start a bit controversial um, with uh, Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg's envision of um, his view of um, human interaction with um, with bots, with avatars, and the likes that he introduced in 2021 at the Metaverse. Actually, he started two years ago as his Horizon project to create a digital world where um, people users are immersed to virtual environments and with massive kinds of of assets, gadgets, um, um, 
equipment um, interconnected yeah, with virtual reality, augmented reality, extended reality via mobile devices and the likes. But actually, um, these kinds of metaverse that he envisioned uh, was supposed to be social. So um, people should be able to meet up other people um, for entertaining, for work purposes and for socializing. It doesn't matter about time and distance um where they were and um they should they should interact with each other in a in a virtual economy yeah um, this was the post in that ecosystem to buy and sell goods so it be b to c possible and and that's all in advance of the the mobile internet yeah so um um that was his vision well now three four years five years later doesn't matter when you uh, look at when it has started. Um, this hasn't happened so far. Yeah? So I'm still meeting my wife, my family and friends in real life. In physics, I don't have my 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 VR headset on. Um, actually, especially with respect to these kinds of uh, equipment around the metaverse, um, the, the headsets and VR glasses and, um, and the likes, um, they are... Um, they're getting end of life by Apple, for instance, who de announced their Vision Pro recently. A meter by themselves gave up on um, developing their um, Quest VR and uh, Oculus Go headsets. Uh, and even Google, with their project Iris, has given up on, on kind of high end mixed reality headsets to develop by themselves. They rather partner with, <clears throat> with others like Samsung, Qualcomm to come up with some, some better fit for the mass market. So, however, um, um, the kind of um, paradigm, the metaverse, that has evolved still, yeah, and that has been picked up by others, probably by us, yeah, where we are um, in the smart manufacturing industry for sector moving ahead to integrate um, the physical and digital world with with uh, each other in the in the industrial metaverse. Yeah, that, um, that has not only been picked up by um, by thought leaders like Siemens, Bosch, and the likes. Now it has even come to practice um, with other key enabling technologies that have emerged in the past, well, probably five to ten years, so to speak, um, with the rise of um, AI ML, which is um, uh, deployed nearly everywhere. I recently. Um, uh, watched at uh, the service now, virtually, how they are um, deploying AI agents in the 150s in their um, current service management uh, platform, Scanadu. Um, the Internet of Things, everything is getting connected from edge to cloud. The edge is eating the cloud, probably prognosticated by, by Gartner 10 years ago. Um, digital twin, I like to highlight this kind of concept of um, having a representation of the physical world in, in digital ways. And um, this, this newer um, um, tools, equipment, gadgets, or virtual and augmented reality, uh, trust about, especially for the last mile, through networks, cellular networks, uh, mobile networks, uh, because these final, I would say, um, handy devices, um, are, are with the user and they don't, we don't we are cables around with us. So uh, we are having to bridge the gap from a network perspective to the end user, the last mile. Um, with secure technologies, the blockchain comes to the end to speak. Yeah? And it's all about uh, with highest um, automation um, uh, deployed in, in our um, 7 by 24 networks. Um, this, is, um, this is bridging the gap and this is leading from the metaverse concepts really into um, IT-OT converging solution sets and environments at our industrial end user site where they appreciate the um, enhancements, the energy um, uh, less usage of our optimized self-healing networks. Um, going one step further, um, the telecommunication metaverse is um, where things come together from from the final 
um, integration of end user needs with the kinds of um, um, use cases, solutions, interactions that our users need to exchange with guaranteed, um, from a service quality, guaranteed low latency um, data from different sources with each other, where we are going from from edge to multi-access edge compute nodes. Yeah, so our um, local um, data centers equipped with telecommunication infrastructure to then the big cloud um, uh, data centers, um, where then probably um, for the whole enterprise, um, the current course of action is monitored and not only monitored, again, I'm referring here to the digital twin concept, but uh, probably even with respect to um, um, operation, remote operated and remote controlled. And for this kind of um, telecommunications metaverse, yeah, amongst um, collaborative ecosystem, yeah, not every vendor can um, provide all kind of services in this chain of interconnected uh, points by themselves, neither from the infrastructure to network to the asset perspective. No, we have to provide in a in a commercial uh, trustful ecosystem these kinds of efficiency on a on global scale to to then end. And now I'm probably getting the curve here. Yeah? Um, to what is really what really matters, yeah, and what really can change the way and, and life, how the metaverse could impact us, uh, for instance, for remote surgery. And this has happened this year that um, in um, in 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 a um, clinic in Florida, surgeons um, interconnected with five G, yeah. Um, um, they're operating patients remotely located in Dubai and Shanghai. And um, uh, this hospital, um, sorry, this, this hospital in China um, has been surgeons in Florida um, um, operating um, via uh, doctors using the VR headsets, yeah, with the real time live stream um, into the operations room and implanted over um, 60 screws into the patient's spinal cord. And um, for this kind of uh, use cases, that's where the, the networks we are working on are, are, are built for. And, and we are having to look from these use cases to these kinds of data traffic patterns that um, are required to stand the the loads, the requirements, and the implementation needs here um, for these users in such um, uh, use cases, that um, the the telecommunication metaverse is um, bringing to life. So um, I mean that this um, um, that was my point for today from 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 bottom up from from the metaverse to industrial metaverse and telecommunication metaverse for real-time remote operation surgery for the session. Thank you. Brilliant, Thomas. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Let me introduce our next speaker, Eric Major from Cologne, Germany, to present on how 5G enables compounds and combinatorics for smart industry infrastructures. Eric, are you there? Yes, yeah, sorry, just playing around with the, uh, the equipment here. So, um, the, um, welcome to everybody. So, um, my topic is going to be about the economic um, implications of what we see here, right? So, compounds and combinatorics, what are they? Compounds are a gross way you're venture capital investor wants to go from 1x to 10x to 100x. And your combinatories are the following, where you want to use one infrastructure for multiple things. Uh, as just Thomas also alluded, 
we have our physical environment, but also our virtual environment. Then, like, you know, I'm going to explain um, the 5G orchestration that we have and, and all the use cases and the possibilities that we have in telecom and are pretty much unknown to the, uh, the world at large. So we need to appreciate that in the telecommunications industry, we're very advanced in our ways of, of billing, segmenting, and what have you. And these other industries don't have that, uh, that allows the, um, uh, the connectivity uh, um, opportunities. And then we're going to present you a GV business case, so joint venture business case between a public and a private investor. Remember, we are telecom communications companies. We're usually invested by our sovereign wealth funds. That sovereign wealth funds, due to economic, geopolitical, and what have you situations, want to build also secure infrastructure, smarter infrastructure, and a more ESG-oriented uh, infrastructure. And then at the end, um, I will elaborate on uh, how you can start that journey. So talk about your factors. So let's dive in. When we talk about the compounds, um, many of you might know the TM Forum. And the Telecom Management Forum does over 100 um, catalyst projects a year where they trial with multiple operators, the champions, and multiple suppliers on new models in the industry. And these are projects, these are catalyst projects, and I'm in a jury of that. And what you see there is um, advancing in, in, in doing the new possible in the telecommunications industry. And this is a project, this is a one-off. And this you can see as your Royal class customers. You start the flight, you really, these are your key customers, you really treat them well. They have come to you with multiple problems that they have in, 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 their, um, in their industry. So take an example, the energy industry. The energy industry needs to move from concentrated turbines in gas to distribute energy on renewables with batteries and, and a very different um, like situation where they need a lot of connectivity, right? Good example. Then if you have those projects, you can then move into a product. And from that first class, you can move into your business class and operators are very good in this. Operators are very good in running networks. We have our knocks. We can do 99% nine uptime. We're extremely good in this. Why not only use it for telecom, but also use it beyond connectivity? And then the third leg is platforms. With our suppliers, I've just listed beyond now here, you can um, start to work on platforms and then you open up your economy class. So if you productize, you have your business class, that's why you built the product and you can launch in, 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 uh, to multiple clients in a very efficient way, the automation process, so to say. And if I go on a platform, I allow everybody else just connect to my APIs and to program with my APIs and I have 100, 100x. So in the project, I have a 1x, in the product, I have a 10x, and in the platform, I have a 100x. And what we need to do here is work with those industry platform providers like the Hitachi's of this world, like the Snyder's, the Siemens, and the Huawei's. Let me give a few examples. So I've worked with Hitachi on like, you know, getting away from the diesel engine in schools, retooling the buses, the yellow buses. What we did there is rip out the diesel engines. Underneath the bus, we did the batteries. And what the bus could do in the daytime, it could load the school. The school had the battery and also pulling from their solar from their roof. And they could do the two like transport runs and even allocate the buses to other transport than the school. So by just showing you that I have an energy transition, I also have a mobility transition, and I also go digital because I allow other people on that platform to make use of those buses. So a very like, you know, structured example how to do that. In the other examples that we have with our partners, I will talk about also the financing. What we also see in China, there's a lot of movement um, around the government from upgrading infrastructures for uh, multi-purposes. So I gave last year the prize to the chairman of uh, China Mobile because they had like alleviated a complete region on advanced uh, 5G by upgrading the hospitals, by upgrading the industry, by upgrading even the fisheries um, outside in, in the harbor areas with their uh, 5G uh, applications. So very important to see uh, that this is a structural thing. And we as a telecom operator need to get our heads around the B2B opportunity here work with our governments and work with our key large clients. As a telecom operator, the energy companies 
are my customer. The transport companies are my customer. The industry companies are my customer. And as you go beyond connectivity. Now, I just mentioned the Telecom Management Forum. Today, there's the summit in Bangkok for the next three days. We have our global summit in um, Copenhagen, upcoming in June next year. What we do there is we show and we work together on the ODA. And an open digital architecture, an ODA, is cross-industry. So what I do here is already standardized when I build my royal class. That means my royal class built, say I built it in Copenhagen, I can also use in Oman. I can also use in the US. I can use in Singapore because we are built on the open digital architecture. And say 99% of all the telecom companies are standardized on this. They work with the TM form of APIs. And you see there's a gazillion of APIs and certifications going on here. And the most important part here is what we do also is we educate our workforce on it immediately. By working on those new standards, implementing these globally, we do what we say and we trial them. But remember, these catalyst projects are projects. They are not yet products and they are not yet platforms. And there's where the great opportunity is. Now, we've just talked about the compounds in our project from 1x to 10x to 100x. Let's now talk about the combinatorics, what we just like highlighted on. Here, there's an investment partner of us, TCR. What does TCR do? TCR is combining public with private funding. That means if you have a government who wants to renew their infrastructure for a smarter grid, for a smarter transport, for a better use of that grid, they then start to peer that money with private investors. Let me give an example. They have worked together with Schneider Electric and got half a billion of private funded from a large private equity player to fund the Schneider Electric projects around these areas of energy transport and digital um, solutions. So it's very important to work from the beginning on with your financial partners and see that this money is available in the markets. So not only talk, we, we often talk about the technical capabilities and these are many and these are extremely powerful, but we need to start to talk to strategy, which is under a huge pressure because they need to get to new revenue sources as I kind of just alluded, we have so much traffic, we have so much energy consumption. How do you even get to 5G? Well, the business case is not in more connectivity. It's as I kind of alluded, it's, it's in smarter connectivity and multi-purpose combinatory uh, connectivity. And what we see here is an investment in a renewable in, in an infrastructure in the US where they renewed the grid, went from like gas turbine to distributed energy with solar and wind, with the batteries, but they also worked with the transport system to get the transport system integrated, like the Hitachi example I just mentioned. And what they also do is now they start to influence behavior. They start to announce to people in the area there is transport for you around. And guess what? Because we have renewables transport from our microgrid, we can offer the transport cheaper and we don't need to build excessive roads because everybody owns its own car. And that's an interesting switch here. If you look at built infrastructure and you look at the congestion of cars, is the solution not only more cars, because that's not the solution, it's the better use of the transport system in a multimodal way. Can we just, if you look at traffic jams, how many people are alone in their car in a traffic jam? That, like, you know, analyzes have countries done like Singapore, where they very clearly, like, you know, elaborate on this fact. If you want to drive your own car, that's going to cost you really a lot of money. If you want to, like, drive an Uber, or, of course, in Singapore, that's Grab and, and, and the other companies, here is, like, you know, a very viable alternative which is uh, much more cost efficient and much more better for the environment. But at the other side, at the other end, they have also excellent transport, which is not like, you know, alluded to a schedule of the bus, but it's alluded to how many people want to go from A to B and they have like, you know, start to really redesign the city that people not move so much out of their areas. That like, you know, retail and work and living are uh, in the same areas, in the same buildings, right? And a very good example is the Capital Group who just bought an entire operator. So Capital Group owns M1. So this is like making infrastructure much, much smarter. And they have realized that the current like connectivity in their buildings is not enough. 
Now, how do you do all this, you might ask? Well, the starting point for operators and people in the business, uh, non-operators and operators, is getting the discussion around strategy, financial, and the ICT on one page. And there we work with our um, very good partner, Trident, who is the supplier for the ecosystem modeling for the, the TM forum called Curate FX. Now, what does Curate FX do? If I design a business interaction modeling, it can immediately start to spew out all the elements that I need in workflow and software. Because remember, we have ODA, ODA the Open Digital Architecture. So it's like Lego blocks. I can pull in, if I have a element in my network that I want to pull in, I can just start building that. I can start simulating. Remember, just um, Thomas just talking about simulations. I can start to simulate before I build it. And it's even better news around the corner because now we start to use like T-Mobile US just moved or just launched their movable 5G antenna. And I've worked with um, effective research in movable antennas like the Paris Olympics, where you have 5G like uplift for the media, which is extremely large, right? By having these antennas and having these simulations, we can like, you know, work with both, start to work with those mobile antennas, see what the effect is. And as Thomas alluded, if that effect is good, we can keep that antenna. We can start to build like that infrastructure otherwise out. So again, what we need to do is get strategy financial around the table. Say I have a ultra light, but laser sharp project, which is in my Royal class already getting the monies. So it's not like a innovation where it's lost monies, but it's an innovation where even my first, like, you know, joint venture makes money. And in my 10 X in my product, I keep making money. If I'm then say a innovative company and I don't want to be part of the product, but I want to do a new innovation, I just cash out on the next round. See what I mean? It's like a investment schema where if we go to um, round B, round C, I get other investors in, into, my, into my mix, right? And then if I go to my 100X, uh, this becomes a, a large platform which could be launched in a country or in a region then like, you know, even other investors come in and like, you know, the um, starting investors can also like, you know, cash in or keep like, you know, keep their 10X uh, um, or 100X um, um, dividends. So here's yes, very important that we also see what we can do here. So if I start to design this, now I can do the following. We just elaborated on it in the smart city. I can start peak shaving for energy because I have this orchestrator, this telecom orchestrator who is so powerful I can say, if you want to use energy, if you want to come home and plug your car in when it is at night and everybody needs the energy, I'm just going to charge you 10, 20 times. If you do that in a downturn at night, you program your car that you do it at night, fine with me, better. If you then like, you know, also um, incentivize people to have home batteries and like, you know, balance the grid even more and supply you with energy when you need it in the grid, you can even remark them more. So see again, that with this like, you know, very advanced orchestration, I'm optimizing these assets. I can do time-based series, location-based series, asset-based series. We've seen like, you know, smart city development in China where they say like, no, I'm not gonna build like you know, this eight lane highway. We need it, but not gonna build it. I'm just gonna move in the middle. In the morning, everybody moves into the city and the evening, everybody moves out of the city. And how do I know this? By my mobile signals. Remember the first slide I showed you, Axiata, their digital labs, they have access to 400 million customers. That is ideal for an energy company. That is ideal for a transport company, right? If you operate in Indonesia, Malaysia, like um, Philippines, what have you, right? There's very dense areas where I want to work with my like subscriber base to give them also the best of that infrastructure and reward them for the right behavior. Right, that you have a real because now we have a bit of a passive, um, um, like you know, relationship with our customers in the B two C side. So my last slides, case example. I'm just going to give a case example which you can read after. The important part is what I just told. So by the end of year five, you have extremely high returns. And then the last slide is what is your effect? Is how can you start? Start that discussion. Work with your royal class. Work on new value models using the telecom orchestration. Remember, please share it. Deliver compounds and combinatories, as we just talked about, and improve even then, like, you know, generative AI, just don't use it for the back office, start to use it in your um, approaches, because we will see CPU, GPU, quantum coming up very quickly. 
Hanesh, thank you very much. I hope that was good. Over oh, to that you. Was, that was great, Eric. That was so great. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Let me introduce our next speaker, Sitara Mediawa from Baku, Azerbaijan, to present on the Spectrum, IoT, and 5G. Over to you, Sitara. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hello, good morning, good afternoon. So just one minute, I would like to share my screen. So, uh, good morning, good afternoon uh, for everyone. So today I'm going to speak about the current last space of spectrum management, IoT and 5G in Azerbaijan. So, uh, firstly, before starting to my presentation, I would like to give a brief information about our company. Uh, so, uh, operating as the first and only satellite operator in the region since, since 2010, other Cosmos has a unique role as a national leader in space technology. So in uh, 2021, we expanded to become the official uh, space agency of the Republic of Azerbaijan with a clear mission to promote connectivity and security for future generation. So today we operate two satellite fleets, Other Space One and Other Space Two, serving KU and C band spectrums respectively. So our telecommunication satellites plays a role as an important gateway in a joint space that uh, connects countries in Europe, Asia, uh, Africa, and uh, other regions. So uh, to date, we have a stable customer has a base in more 45 countries all around the world. And the coverage of the satellites includes uh, Europe, Africa, as I mentioned, Middle East, uh, the Caucasus, and the Central Asia. Uh, so the convenient orbital position of other space one is uh, 45 degrees east, enables us to be competitive in this industry and ensure 97% uh, customer satisfaction. satisfaction. So uh, our strategic priorities revolve around expanding and securing our satellite capabilities. And a major milestone in securing an orbital slot um, at 45, uh, 46 degrees east in both uh, the C and Q bands established under Azerbaijan administration. As is known, the Other Space One uh, satellite uh, uh, launched in 2013, as I mentioned before. So, and this uh, satellite is located at 46 uh, degrees east orbital position, operated in C and Q bands. Uh, of the orbital position belonging to the administration of Malaysia. But since 2020, we have been coordinating internationally, finalizing agreements with uh, almost 265 uh, satellite networks across 34 uh, countries to safeguard this slot. So the transfer of these bands to the name of uh, administ Azerbaijan administration means that the orbital position of Azer Space One satellite no longer belongs to Malaysia. It is operated in the unique and uh, the one orbit of Azerbaijan. It should be noted that the 46 East uh, orbital position is the first and only orbital position has in the geostationary belt. And this will enable Azerbaijan to place its telecommunication satellite in a unique orbital position uh, without depending on any state. So next slide. And uh, we do have uh, also the spectrum management activities in our country. So the managing uh, the radio spectrum is the central to our work at Azer Cosmos, helping Azerbaijan stay strong and competitive in the space and telecommunication fields. Our team actively represents Azerbaijan at uh, you know uh, international IT events where we promote and protect our country's interest in the global space community. Additionally, Azure Cosmos provides consulting and training sessions uh, to the developing countries. Uh, sharing our expertise and supporting the exchange of our knowledge on the best practice for managing spectrum resource effectively. Uh, through these efforts, we help build stronger partnership and support growth across the space industry. 
So we do also have some uh, 5G, uh, you know, activities in our country. But before starting uh, to talk about the 5G activities in Azerbaijan, I would like to give, give a brief information about the 5G. Actually, my colleagues explained everything very well. Thank you so much for that. Uh, but from my point of view, 5G technology brings a new level of connectivity, offering extremely fast, you know, internet speeds and minimal delays. Uh, this improvement will support the next wave of digital experience, allowing people to enjoy high quality streaming, smooth virtual gaming and faster access to large amounts of data. With 5G, we will see big chance in the way we use technology daily. Its impact uh, will reach main industries, creating new facilities for healthcare, transportation, education and more. And as 5G spreads, it promised to make our lives easier, boost business growth and reshape the economy in powerful ways, leading to a more connected world. So, and the status of the 5G in Azerbaijan. So in Azerbaijan, the rollout of 5G is actively supported by our satellite infrastructure, with our uh, satellite fully compatible with the frequency bands needed for 5G. Uh, this allows us to play a direct role in bringing this technology to the country. The ministry acts as a regulatory body to ensure efficient use of frequencies, overseeing measures to manage spectrum effectively. So the regulatory bodies also encourage mobile operators to invent in 5G, helping to expand access across the country. And uh, currently about 39% uh, of Azerbaijan citizens have access to broadband internet and we aim to increase this significantly. A 5G working group was established as part of a plan by the Minister of Digital Development and Transport to develop a 5G strategy for Azerbaijan. Azerkosmos is also the member of this um, working group. So uh, this will support advancement in smart cities and villages. Through reduced broadband access and strategic planning, Azerbaijan is building a more connecting society and brings real benefit benefits to citizens and business alike. And IoT. Uh, so before starting to speak about IoT, I would like to explain the difference uh, between IoT and Internet. So maybe people can confuse uh, these two phrase, phrases. So the Internet connects computers and networks worldwide allowing people to communicate, find information and use online services. So, but the Internet of Things, IoT, is different because it connects everyday objects like applicants, cars and machines to the shared network. So this lets them communicate with each other and work automatically. IoT has the power to change how we do things across many fields. For example, it can help um, automate factories and create smart systems in cities. And in Azerbaijan, uh, IoT is already being used in smart, uh, you know, smart homes and smart villages, smart cities, and for farming to make things work better. So using IoT to save an energy is also seen as an important step toward sustainable growth and making better use of resources. And uh, IoT application in Azerbaijan. Several Azerbaijan firms are leading the way in IoT solutions, including L Smart, Azercell, Smart City, Oakle, Noventing, and etc. And these companies are actively developing technologies that bring the benefits of IoT to our cities and communities, particularly through smart cities infrastructure and remote monitoring solutions. And our collaboration with these companies allows us to support you know, the growing IoT ecosystem and to advance Azerbaijan's position as a regional leader in technology and innovation. And my last slide is about the events that uh, Azerbaijan hosted and uh, is going to host. So with the growth of 5G and IoT, Azerkosmos is focused on global collaboration and knowledge sharing. Uh, we host IAC 74 last year in Azerbaijan and next this year uh, we are going to host next week actually, we are going uh, to host COP29 uh, in Baku in Azerbaijan and uh, next year we are going to you know uh, host WTDC ITU event in Azerbaijan as well. So this uh, gathering allows us to share knowledge 
foster partnership and highlight Azerbaijan achievements, of course, in uh, 5G, IoT, and all the space technology. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Wow, this is uh, excellent. Thank you so much, Sitara. It's very informative. Really appreciate that. Uh, let me introduce our next speaker, Marcus Ferreira from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, to present on AI-powered innovation in industry, transforming agriculture with smart devices. Over to you. Sorry. I'm sharing um, my screen. Can you all see my screen? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you for the introduction, Kanash. So hello, everyone. Um, my name is Marcus Ferreira, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, from the Department of Agriculture and Biological System. And I'll be talking about how AI our innovation in industry has been transforming agriculture with smart devices. I'm excited to discuss the innovative uh, role of sensors and how it has been impacting the industry overall. So I would like to address a few topics um, for this discussion, just to clarify uh, some concepts and ideas. So first, I would like to present the uh, near-infrared spectroscopy and hyperspectral imaging. So we use that to capture spectral information from materials, material composition. And with that, we can propose models to enhance quality control in agriculture and food processing. The next is computer vision technology that we also use, and we combine that with AI. And with that, we can use to analyze visual data with RGB sensors and also automate inspection, ensure consistency, consistent um, quality control for food products. Another technology that we use is electronic nose that it presents itself as uh, with similar tools to olfactory human uh, human system to detect orders um, across various applications in the industry, ranging from monitoring, for example, food freshness, for example, in dairy dairy products and meat products to ripening stages of fruits. And we also have the idea of nanozyme, which is not a sensor itself, but it can be incorporated and used um, to enhance the capability of sens sensing devices. They are basically engineered particles that mimic the catalytic action of natural enzymes. And with this technology, we can enhance crop growth, improve nutrient absorption in agriculture, and also detect pesticide uh, residues, for example. So together, these technologies are revolutionizing the industry by improving efficiency, accuracy, and product quality. So at IELTS now, which stands for Illinois Optical Sensing and Enzyme Engineering Lab, we are applying all these technologies. And I take great pride in our impactful work there. So basically, we divide this uh, facility, this space, into three specific areas or labs. The first one is the Illinois Hyperspectral Imaging Lab, where we are equipped with advanced NIR systems and HSI. And we have been using these sensors to assess crop health, monitor nutrients level, and other prediction composition, uh, such as moisture and solid content, content in food and agriculture, in general ag agriculture products. Uh, we have the ISAL, which is, stands for uh, Illinois Smart Analytical Lab, which is the lab that I work 100% of, of my time. I dedicated over one year of working um, on that lab, and I use their RGB sensors, computer vision application, and also I work with ANOSES and NIR systems to integrate uh, smart devices, such as smart dryers that I'll be presenting um, in just a minute. And also we have the Illinois Nanozyme Engineering Lab, which we work with Nanozyme. And we have promising application in agriculture. And we have also created biosensors for food safety and soil health monitoring. 
So uh, following our research line, we have utilized NIR and HS HSI sensors for numerous industrial challenges to enhance quality control, create optimized systems, reduce loss, and also improve overall efficiency, um, and also maximize productivity and sustainability in the industry level. As I mentioned, in ISO, which is the lab that I work uh, fully um, full time, I have been conducting research using INOLS alone and also so with the integration and incorporation of RGB uh, in IR sensors, HSI, to deliver a wide range of application to the industry. We also are proposing, we are also proposing some miniaturized devices, for example, the ones that we can use in greenhouses and um, to, to test and monitor crops. And they can all be linked in a Wi-Fi system. So they are all uh, connected in different sections of the, uh, the greenhouse to deliver uh, in, uh, precision in data acquisition and also data uh, treatment and evaluation. And from the nanozyme perspective, um, we have the inorganic nanozymes that have been established since 2007. It is a widely uh, used uh, approach in the industry. They mimic natural enzyme activity pretty well, but they are very cost, um, they are costly. So basically what we are, what we are proposing is the, um, the uh, creation of the uh, manufacturing of organic nanozymes. They are cost-effective, eco-friendly, and also with the potential use for um, food agriculture. I'll be focusing uh, for the next, pres like back next slides on the uh, NIR HSI and RGB in all systems, since those are, my, are the technologies that I have been, they're aligned with my research. So this is a prototype of an enols, uh, which I call fusion enols. It is an AI empowered fusion enols. I designed this um, equipment from the scratch at ISAL, um, which is the, the lab that I've just mentioned. And it's composed of eight MOS that stands for uh, metal oxide sensors and RGB sensors as well. And it has a temperature and humidity control on top, as you can see here. And uh, it is meant for a broad variety of products and full connectivity with Wi-Fi and other connectivity uh, capability that can you can control it from your house or from any other uh, place that you are. You can connect to the lab and then uh, turn it on and then get it uh, for work done. We are using this device uh, on an ongoing research for the detection of uh, ag gender. So basically the industry, it kills 7 billion male chicks every year and that leads to 3.5 to $14 billion loss annually. So the idea is simple. Uh, you can take the eggs, um, place inside of the equipment, and then it will evaluate for the VLCs or volatile compounds release. And then based on these volatiles, we can determine if the egg is male or female within four to five days, which is reasonable time to get rid of them before you conduct to like 30 or or more days until they um, they are they turn into uh, fully uh, chicks and then it can be just thrown away. Um, other opportunity and possibility to use this device is to detect freshness assessment in food industry in a wide uh, widely or in a wide variety of range in many possibilities for quality control. So this is like. Um, for the ag uh, evaluation is not the only uh, capability of these uh, device. So basically, um, we also have an ongoing research on drying systems. So I have built a dryer from the scratch as well, attached to RGB and NIR sensors. And we use that dryer to determine the, the predict, uh, to determine and predict the endpoint in real time of any dried goods. We have called it Smart Dryer, of course, and it's composed of the basic principles of a normal dryer, a power supply, a fan, a heat element, a, a controlling for the air um, uh, flow. And we have the sensors, uh, as you can see here, from six to nine NIR, um, RGB, and electronic nodes. We also have a scale to account for moisture loss and water loss. 
And as you can see on the right, we have the first prototype, which I designed, which, which I call version 1.0. But we have uh, updated this version to version 2.0. And this version 2.0, we have been conducting intensive uh, research, uh, working for CARD, which, which stands for Center uh, for Advanced Research in Drying. They it's a group that they focus on developing innovative drying technologies to enhance energy saving and product uh, product qual quality overall. And we have determined the end point of Apple's license using, using this device. And this drying system was designed by me, uh, as I mentioned, and I used NIR and RGB systems for uh, quality control measurements in general. And also, uh, for example, for the RGB um, sensing, I was proposing the determination of the uh, uh, area reduction, and which means shrinkage for the same Apple slices. And we have also uh, recently proposed a newer version using H NIR HSI, McNary to enhance moisture prediction endpoint due to the uh, ability of HSI to better predict uh, moisture distribution within the sample with better accuracy as well. Um, I have written uh, a few uh, algorithms and codes for these equipment. So uh, the one on the on the right is the RGB one, which I used on the version 2.0 of the drying system so that we could account for uh, area reduction and shrinkage. So basically would place your apple slice and then uh, the, uh, the RGB sensor, sensor will be getting the images and then the code will be treating them just analyzing and getting a final reduction, uh, which basically for Apple's license, it's around 30%. And on the left, we have the NIR HSI, which, is, uh, which I designed for this new um, evaluation and this new experiment that we are conducting using uh, Smart Dryer. Uh, basically, it also uh, assess like food for moisture distribution and other features um, in food processing. Um, so basically we have, uh, written a review paper, which, uh, with, where the title is portable and miniature sensors for food authentication. And it's good to know that we have these availability, availability of portable devices to guarantee food safety because fraud in food cost annually 10 to $15 billion dollars. And there is a rising demand for developing portable and miniature sensors to facilitate food authentication throughout the supply chain. So we are happy with that. And we have also proposed um, a new research line with a new proposal that basically uh, accounts for the AI enhanced, enhanced inline spectral sensing technology for forecasting beef tenderness. So this time for the meat industry and basically, it implies the application of HSI system to predict tenderness accurately and potentially allowing producers to adjust processing or grading based on, on quality. So this is the, the newest um, research that we have been conducting at ISO. Thank you. That's all I have to share. Thank you so much for your attention. Oh, this is brilliant. Thank you, Marcus. I really appreciate that. Uh, and uh, let me introduce our next speaker, Kevin Graham from Melbourne, Australia, to present on connection is the lifeline. Why 3GPP, MCX, and FRMCS services are vital. Thanks, Kanesh. Thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to join you and present. So, uh, just... Is my screen sharing now? Yes. Wonderful. Look, um, thanks for the opportunity. I like the, the name of this, this forum, Exchanging Ideas, um, the Critical Communications Association that I lead as a global CEO um, is all about sharing um, ideas around delivering um, capability for a safer, more connected world, and, and particularly empowering critical communications users like those indicated in this slide um, to 
um, leverage secure, trusted, and, and particularly standardized um, connectivity. The critical communications users yeah, have some quite um, demanding requirements in terms of coverage, network availability, resilience, performance and interoperability. Um, when you think about the government agencies, public safety, the, one of the major issues is to ensure that in times of crisis, they can successfully interoperate on both the um, voice data and a video situational awareness basis. Importantly, the information transferred uh, needs utmost security. And these solutions need to scale from um, on-site, in-campus, underground, through to uh, city-wide, regional-wide networks. And most importantly, the functionality and device form factors need to fit their end missions. Um, you know, the, the consumer type devices may satisfy some of the, the business needs, but for those users that operate in, you know, some really adverse conditions, you know, as they're running towards danger is where our citizens are all, you know, attempting to run away. Um, and their work environments involve, you know, um, uh, protective suits, gloved hands, um, and, you know, environments with smoke, inclement weather and so on. So, you know, one of the things that we need to do is ensure that the innovations that are that are happening from both the consumer and enterprise end, from both the, the connectivity through the applications and devices um, can de deliver the connection that's literally the lifeline for many of these end users when they're in these situations. Our critical communications user base is just a fraction of the global um, yeah, device um, consumer market. And consequently, we you know, rely on um, cooperation globally, regionally, and at a local level. And I'll go through um, in this presentation some of the ways that we we attempt to go about um, making our voice heard, given the end customers that we are um, supporting, that are supporting our society and our families. Just a bit about the Critical Communications Association. Yesterday, our association turned 30 years old. Um, we started out originally um, working with public safety to define a narrowband standard called TETRA, and that's been widely adopted across the world. Um, we've moved you know, about uh, 10 or 12 years ago to recognise that these users require the same broadband um, capability that citizens um, and some enterprise enjoy today. So we work with the standards bodies. We became the first market representation partner into 3GPP with the same aim to sort of catalyze a multi-vendor standards-based um, ecosystem uh, that was you know, based on um, broadband standards that were fit for purpose for these industries. And we're, we're pleased to have a, a membership that spans from industry, academia, through to major mobile network operators who are delivering capability to governments already, um, the likes of AT&T, BT, STC, Telefonica, uh, One New Zealand and Spark in New Zealand. And yeah, this is all about cooperating to leverage um, some of the innovations that have already been spoken about uh, yeah, prior in this in this um, this session, how do we bring those um, and leverage those uh, to our government and um, critical communications industry? We're a, a, a small but global association, and we rely on collaborations with obviously standards bodies, um, test houses, certification bodies, and also the peak. Um, associations representing some of our vertical critical communication user markets like utilities, like railways, uh, government operators, um, public safety, 
um, emergency number answering and so on. Like everyone else, our, our journey has been narrow band on the right hand side with Tetra and P25, which is standardized narrow band systems. But now as a result of the work in 3GPP from LTE Advanced Pro, we now have a suite of mission critical capability known as MCX in the standards. Uh, and you know, we are working with our, our partners and 3GPP to um, progress the evolution of these standards through 5G and into 6G. As a, as a guide, the MCX or mission critical services, which involves mission critical press for talk, mission critical data, and mission critical video. Um, this slide just gives you an idea of the progress of some of the MCX adoption across the world. Uh, from pilots that have gone on to commercial deployments that are that have commenced and and rolled out. Obviously, there is you know a lot of our critical communications um, sectors are also relying on um, private mobile networks for um, obvious reasons, and uh, you know we're seeing the increase in deployment of these and. And particularly in regions where private LTE, private 5G spectrum has become available. And obviously some of the countries mentioned here are those that have that have a have a private spectrum model. Um, hopefully we can see other other regions um, encouraged to do likewise or work with the mobile network operators in ways that which they can deliver um, yeah, cost effective solutions um, for all of these these sectors. We work with our partners around the world on a common ecosystem of layers. <clears throat> At the top, we need to make sure that government legal policy spectrum frameworks are supporting um, the adoption of mission critical capable um, standards, their implementation through the networking um, deployment and environment and then the, the applications um, that can be made available to the end users. And also looking at the operational procedures that, that need to be adapted and changed as people are able to access some of this capability. We work in three core streams of activity. Obviously the standards activity through what we've been doing with narrowband um, as custodians of the, the Tetra narrowband standard in 3GPP from 4G advance and now working with um, the stakeholders in the standards bodies to ensure that 5G and 6G support these end user capabilities. Um, an important part of this is obviously ensuring that spectrum availability um, for the various use cases, and we'll talk a little bit more about um, the fact that we're evolving the capability for high power um, user equipment. We're looking at leveraging 5G um, direct device to device, exploiting the features of Sidelink. And likewise, how how these, um, these capabilities should be enhanced in 6G. An important piece of the work is also around ensuring that um, we're working on interoperability, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of this in a subsequent slide. As part of our, our, our work, um, our stakeholders come together to, to pull together uh, world, press, uh, world best um, advice and guidance. And these are just some of the areas that we've been working on. Um, some new work that has just started is in respect to ensuring there's an in, a way of, of narrowband systems working with broadband, critical broadband systems, as these large user groups and nations look at their um, dual working and or transition to their mission critical broadband future. Um, high power UE is another one that's important in, in, in conjunction with device to device to um, 
extend the coverage range that are required by our end users. And obviously control rooms feature fairly heavily in, in the um, end use sectors that we are actively involved. We do a lot of this work through specific um, task forces under our critical comms um, broadband group. And just you can see here on the screen the sorts of activities in terms of guidance around mission critical broadband applica applications, spectrum evolution. Our use cases require quality of service, um, priority and preemption. And, and therefore, there's a lot of guidance required around delivering that capability. Um, connectivity, um, looking at all forms of connectivity, uh, you know, it's, it's realised by our community that to get the coverage and availability required and the redundancy, multiple connectivity is required from terrestrial networks to non-terrestrial. So the work in 5G, non-terrestrial and future 6G is really important as well, you know, directed device capability. And then there's all the field operational side in terms of um, orchestrating masses, massive mission critical video, um, mission critical broadcasting, and also understanding some of the challenges um, in implementing this capability on, on practical networks. Um, and, and at the other end, we're also looking at, at helping the ecosystem evolve um, devices that meet end user requirements in these particular sectors. For quite a while now, we've been involved in ensuring that we develop a testing um, certification and conformance regime similar to what has prevailed with our narrowband technologies such as Tetra. Um, for years now, we've been involved in the Etsy plug tests, um, helping with both the MCX and the future rail mobile um, communication solutions, uh, allowing vendors to, to uh, mutually cross-test, and as a result of that, also validating the standards. And each year we hold um, sessions on both of these streams, um, the next one in Texas A&M in a joint um, program in February. We're also pleased to have progressed a um, certification program with the Global Certification Forum. So we're, we're building the capability to certify devices with mission critical functionality, 3GPP, MCX, in a similar way that consumer devices and IoT devices are certified by GCF. Um, and we're looking at trying to extend that in, into both um, uh, performance, performance uh, uh, testing and also interoperability of, um, of devices and networks. One of the things that our end users are, are pulling together on is um, trying to harmonise across the globe, ensure that where um, procurements are moving along a standards-based um, certified product basis so that um, interoperability can, um, a confidence can be, um, can be assured. One other part is obviously our, our involvement in socialising some of the needs of our community into the future 6G. And the, the core themes, again, for our industry are around delivering guaranteed service, ensuring that deployment and coverage uh, meets requirements, that resilience and robustness uh, are, are key um, platforms in a 6G future. And most importantly, that security um, is, uh, is supported. Quick plug for our annual international conference each year our community comes together in a in a global conference um, in june next year this will be held in brussels um, the home of the eu and obviously uh, this brings together all of the stakeholders existing government operators and mobile network operators who are moving forward or contemplating delivering capability to both uh, government public safety and sectors like utilities um, industry energy resources. So uh, 
with that, I'd, I'd just like to finish um, our success and the success of our societies and the government agencies and, and critical industries that support our families and our um, our societies is really important. And we can only drive this if we cooperate both at a local and international level. We work together with, uh, you know, the innovators um, in our industry, the standards bodies, and that we bring together all of the network providers, um, industry and end users to understand and deliver that capability in a in a um, a, a form that is sustainable and um, economic. And that's going to require bringing scale, which means cooperation between our different critical comm sectors. Um, and, and finally, you know, it's important that, you know, through this that we drive the innovation and draw through the innovation that, that is clearly happening within the, the 5G space. And we'll, we're seeing the um, evolution into 6G. So ultimately, we're all about support critical comms regulation, standardization, certification, because really this connection is is the lifeline to the to these end users and actually is is more and more um, as other use cases we've seen in this presentation are all becoming mission and business critical so um thank you for the opportunity Kanesh, and um thank you for the opportunity to to socialize our message um across our, our broad eco ecosystem that's very impressive Thank you, Kevin. Really appreciate that. Um, let me introduce our next speaker, Srija Gadi Raju from Munich, Germany, to present on how 5G is transforming additive manufacturing. Over to you. Thank you, Kanish. Let me just quickly share my screen. So I hope my screen is visible. Uh, are you able to enlarge to full? Yeah, we'll do one. Yeah. Does that look okay now? Uh, no, not yet. Okay. Mm, now, does that work? Uh, are you able to see the uh, slide mode at the bottom of this? This would you be able to click to the full screen? Uh, uh, to be no? honest, no, I don't have any other option right. here. Just continue, no problem. Thank you. Because I'm I'm doing that from doing this from the browser, maybe that's why. But yeah. Okay. So uh, good morning and good evening, everyone. Um, so um, I'm Srija, and I work as a service manager at a company called Innovatic. We manufacture 3D printers. And I really want to let you know, guys, how we are expecting 5G to change our field, that is additive manufacturing. Uh, because our, currently, additive manufacturing, the past decade has been so big for us. and the industry has grown so much from prototypes. We have reached the phase of production now. And the fourth industrial revolution includes additive manufacturing as much as it includes IoT. So that will be my, the topic for uh, my presentation today. First of all, uh, the role of additive manufacturing currently in the past decade, as I have mentioned, it has changed quite a lot. We have started with uh, prototyping and now we are almost there with the uh, continuous production because we as a manufacturer, we produce industrial uh, 3D printers and we are almost producing the uh, end parts for the customers according to their needs. What, how does 5G is going to play a role in it? Currently, we are having multiple ways of uh, watching how the production is going on and uh, to see the uh, performance of our machines online. But 5G is going to change that to a great extent. And it's going to enable us with real-time monitoring, automation, and, of course, high-speed data exchange. <clears throat> For us in additive manufacturing, the real-time monitoring plays a key role 
uh, it is the same for the traditional manufacturing process as well. But the key concept of additive manufacturing is the our ability to change the models and the, uh, the ability to change the designs quickly than uh, traditional manufacturing. So there, real-time monitoring is going to add a great value to us. Uh, when we are printing a part using our printer, if only if, if the print is not being successful and we are knowing that immediately that will be the first um, phase for us where we are uh, you know improving our processes and also it will help us um, 5g is going to help us with the feed us with the feedback loops um, as uh, the previous presentations men mentioned we are we will be able to use uh, image processing and then we will be able to identify the error before it actually happens. So that's gonna that's gonna save us a lot of time in the industry. And we at the end we want to integrate our um, additive manufacturing, the modern technologies with the traditional manufacturing. So there should there should be a possibility of uh, having CNC machines and metal three D printers and plastic manufacturing um, printers in the same factory we will we can imagine that using a digital twin or smart factory now but to make that happen we would need a lot of automation and that's where 5g is going to help us in the future the uh, the benefits of uh, real time monitoring are as similar to all the other industries we will reduce our uh, downtime to a great extent we will the there are um, industries or there are companies which are completely dependent on uh, 3D printers for their uh, production. In these cases, by having the real-time monitoring, we can reduce the downtime quite a lot. Uh, coming to the next part, once we reduce the downtime, that comes to the quality of the part which you are printing. Again, with the real-time monitoring, combining the feedback loops which we are getting, um, we will be able to do the quality control much faster than what we are doing now because currently we don't have ISO standards for additively manufactured parts. And we we really have to, um, you know, the human intervention is quite a lot uh, for now. So there we are expecting 5G to help us and uh, to take us to the next steps of very efficient printing with our printers. So um, also the on-site data processing, I work in service. So I definitely can say that when you have issues with a printer, it'll take at least two to three days. If it is a big issue, it'll take two to three days for us to identify the issue, which uh, what part is gone and how can you repair that? So that's, that's where um, we are, again, we can rely on 5G that you we are feeding a lot of data every time we are dealing with an issue. And the more issues we deal with, later it's going to help us reduce this uh, whole um, you know whole time to identify the issue and uh, address the issue and then bring the production back um, the while uh, when we are talking about on site data processing we can also talk about the real time analytics like uh, this this applies particularly in the application team where they are uh, developing the parameters every time you actually use a new material to print you you need to experiment at least for a week to to get the right uh, quality and to get the uh, quality which you are looking for this is where again we can we can rely on feeding in the data and then getting the output and in on the whole we are reducing the uh, time which we need for developing a process to print a part with additive manufacturing so um, on the whole we we can expect or we are we will be looking at a future where we have smart factories as i have mentioned earlier we are looking for a plant where we have traditional manufacturing and modern manufacturing technologies together. And 5G is going to play a great role there by connecting all the machines together and by giving us the opportunity to monitor and uh, seamline the process all together on a, on a computer screen, I would say. And we, we want to see a future where everything is automated and, uh, uh, you know, we have multiple um, printers all together and we have print factories along with the traditional methods where we are manufacturing products continuously 
Also, when uh, it comes to the real-time adjustments, we are looking at a phase wherein we are doing predictive maintenance rather than doing the maintenance after the issue. We are we are predicting the issue uh, with the feedbacks, feedback loops, and then we want to address them right away. Now, um, I just want to let you know about the recent uh, use case or case study. Airbus has already started doing this not with uh, modern manufacturing but with the traditional manufacturing they have uh, introduced their own 5g network and they have uh, created a completely not completely but semi-automated uh, production plant in toulouse and they have uh, automated quite a lot of their production they have uh, agvs connected with their production lines and they have they have uh, published it that uh, they have increased uh, twenty percent of their, uh, they have seen twenty percent of increase in their uh, efficiency, and UK is um, the next country which is uh, which has invested quite a lot. This AMRC five uh, G factory, they are not really concentrated. They are they are not producing any particular part. Rather, they are giving the solutions to different companies, and they are uh, they are helping the companies with uh, smart solutions, and they are laying the path for the companies to uh, adopt that path of uh, you know automation automating their uh, complete lane and with this um, amrc 5g factory for now we are looking at uh, um, a more streamlined process wherein they are going to let the other companies lead their way to towards the 5g integrated smart factories and creating their own print firms etc but uh, also, we have uh, when we are talking about the possibilities and the best things which can happen with 5G, we we also have um, considerations when it comes to manufacturing. Already, manufacturing is a tedious um, tedious whole plant is uh, very clumsy, and above that, building a network for the plant or for the company, which is uh, which is according to the privacy requirements, will be very difficult initially because that that definitely needs a lot of money and data security here plays a key role as it plays for all the other industries but we are talking about a great risk here because we are thinking about automation and huge machines connected on connected over internet and uh, if only something happens we are expecting the whole plant to shut down or go kaboom in the worst case so data security will be one of the biggest things uh, which we have to acknowledge or address before we introduce into this into the manufacturing um, sector i would like to conclude my presentation by saying that definitely 5g is going to play a very key role in additive manufacturing evolution we have seen like our industry being 40 years old we have seen a great growth and we have a long way to go we really are looking at a i think looking at a factory where we have uh, 3d printers and robots taking care of the printed parts and we are having the continuous uh, production so yeah i'm just crossing my fingers and i'm really hoping that uh, 5g is gonna help us a lot in the future thank you so much for the opportunity ganesh uh, this is awesome Srija. i uh, really appreciate that uh, so uh, let's do this. Uh, we have like 10 or 20 minutes uh, Q&A session and uh, let's make a, 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 a great brainstorming uh, among speakers. Uh, please feel free to uh, switch on your cameras and uh, uh, Srija, would you mind to uh, switch off the slide? Uh, Mr. Kaneshwaran, before starting the case session, I believe Shiva Pokhral is also here. Mr. Oh, yeah. Shiva. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, hi, Shiva. All right. So, Shiva, um, so you are here. So, maybe uh, let me introduce Shiva. Uh, just one Hel second. Yeah. Hello, hi, Dr. everyone. Hi, Dr. Uh, Shiva Pokhral. Hello, Kanesh. Australia yeah. uh, from the Deakin Internet Research would like to present for 10 minutes unlocking the potential of zero trust SEMCOM networking. Over to you. Uh, I can quickly share my slides. Just one second. Let me uh, 
give you a co-host. Yeah, I should work now. Uh, it's not giving me option to share my slide. Yeah, I think I can do it now. I hope my slides are visible now. Yes. Uh, thank you, Kanesh. Yeah, I'm going to give a brief uh, introduction about what is happening at Deccan Internet Research Lab now. We, call, we recently named it as IoT Research Internet of Things Research Lab. We have established it in 2022 under my leadership. We do have a few PhD students, postdocs, a lot of industry collaborations, international collaborations as well, which I'm going to uh, introduce in my talk as well. So let's talk about the title itself. So zero trust, why we need to go for zero trust is because of security reasons. And why we are thinking of for zero trust in semantic communication or multipath networking is the internet is always multipath. We have several paths to connect within each other and semantic communication is on high. I'm going to introduce semantic communication first, then we'll move to multipath networking and zero trust. Moving forward, what is semantic communication networking? So the existing networking, the existing communication networks is what discovered by Sanon. Sanon has overlooked some of the semantic aspects. What we transmit from our sender to receiver now is actually the message bits. We never transmit the intention what the sender wants the receiver to know. So there is another big research driven wing that has recently got a lot of momentum, which is operating at level C here in my figure, you can see. So getting some insights into what sender wants to send to the receiver, what sender uh, sender's intention when the receiver receives that message is much more important than sending the actual bits that the sender wants to send. So level A is already there. Now there has been a lot of moves even in 5G, IGT groups, 3GPP, IETF, on my recent uh, talk there. So we all have been thinking of a big move towards intent-based communication. And there has been such developments, parallel developments, even in linguistic. For example, people may think of, okay, phonology, morphology, syntax, which are kind of, I mean, basic building blocks of our language. But there has been no such notion of semantics in communication networking, where semantics and pragmatics has been well understood in linguistic. So with all these recent moves, we have been driving research and then building some kind of test bed prototype and then proof of concepts to demonstrate that semantic communication should be the next generation communication networks. So there, there has been few works that we have already um, published and then some of them are still under work by our PhD students. Next is zero trust. So what is zero trust? So in security, normal, normally how we secure our home is we, we, we try to build kind of, I mean, perimeter of our area and then, and then try to um, uh, provide some rule-based arguments with our rule-based conditions within that perimeter to secure our home. So uh, this is what has been applied even in network and internet nowadays. We all are focused to perimeter based systems where we define our radius and then establish firewall and some other security mechanism to do that. But with all these moves towards semantic communication networking, 6D networks, and then all these evolution of large language models and experience driven networking, more ML and AI based networking, such security norms, which we can call it as a seminal norms, won't be able to make our networks secure. So that's the reason we are moving towards zero trust. Zero trust is a completely new concept, which has been standardized by NIST recently. And it operates on the principle of like, never trust, always verify. 
every device in a network should have a specific verification mechanism to develop access control for that device. So when we do not trust each other, we always want to verify each other in the network, then there is no norm of perimeter-based networks that we need. So yeah, we have done some kind of uh, um, algorithmic structure and proof of concept has been developed towards decentralizing zero trust because centralized concepts of zero trust may not directly apply in modern network, which is fully distributed and decentralized. The one that is standardized by NIST is centralized. The one that Dekin has been developing is fully decentralized one. And, and this is the idea behind it. The, what you can see on the left panel is fully centralized version, which has been uh, standardized by NIST. The one we developed is, is on the right panel, this box and this box here where we demonstrate ways and develop proof of concept on how we can decentralize policy engine and make it operate with the policy admin administration procedures so that we can uh, fully operationalize in, it in a distributed fashion. Again, a few of the articles and technical reports and, and proof of concept has already been there and the links has been posted here in my slides. Next important concept that I was thinking of talking today is multi-path networking. So what can drive multi-path networking is again, TCP has been the fundamental internet protocol for 30 years now. And there has been several versions of multi-path TCP being developed and verified. We are kind of first to develop uh, GQL based multi-path TCP with um, GQL again is, is a kind of AIML, tested AIML protocol, which has been quite substantial. and improving the current performance of it. This is in collaboration with Nokia Bell Labs and, and Anwar is, is kind of director of, of the Bell Lab research uh, during that time. Uh, again, so a kind of article has already been published on it. We are still working on the proof of concept while our test bed has been verified in in-house research lab. Uh, in parallel, we have also been developing uh, multi-path condition control, a kind of uh, con not only source control like multi-path TCP, but moving towards network control as well. Again, driven by mm, a kind of uh, deep Q learning aspects or and 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 deep mm, deterministic policy gradient aspects. So, so more towards AI ML driven multi-path condition control. Uh, and, and we have shown that it can beat the performance of existing MPCC, which has already been in, tested by ITF. And, and this has been quite appreciated in our ITF meetings as well in Brisbane, last time ITF one on three. Uh, next recent works that has been uh, in progress, even though the publication has already been out, uh, some other innovations of this version has already been in progress in the lab is, uh, how can we develop multipath TCP so that we can help current developments in AI and ML? For example, we have shown a use case of um, AIS learning, distributed AIS learning systems. We have also shown a use case of decentralized training of LLM, how we can uh, decentralize train large language models, for example, LAMA2 or ChatGPT over um, well, well, local learning can happen in, in, in different countries or regions, and then the global learning can be regulated by some other ends. So kind of developing a networking protocol that can help the modernizations of AI and ML. And this is the corresponding architecture to see. And we have shown that in real test beds, our performance has been much more um, uh, appropriate and efficacious than, than the existing protocols um, in the sense. So I tried to provide a brief overview of what is happening in the lab. Basically, we develop proof of concepts and then network test space in our lab. We have a team and collaboration with several other people around um, the industries as well. For example, our main collaboration is with Comcast and now uh, with Charter as well. 
uh, we have started our collaboration with Nokia Bell Labs, but now we have extended it to Amazon as well with the team. We do have long-standing links with CSIRO, which is one of the great government organizations in Australia, doing a lot of research basically on zero trust, quantum machine learnings, quantum securities, and other aspects. We do have long-standing links with Comcast. Uh, we do have some fundings, which has been ongoing from Comcast corporations as well. Uh, the key members in IoT Research Lab now are Zeno Choi, Jonathan Choi, and our students. Uh, thank you, everyone. And please feel free to have any suggestions and comments. Uh, that, was, that was really brilliant. Thank you, Dr. Shiva. You made it on time, <laughs> finally. So I really appreciate that. Uh, so let's do this. Uh, let me just share this one particular slide, if you can be able to see now. Uh, so uh, just one second. Okay, so I I'm just going to put up this for a couple of seconds, and then uh, I will switch off the slide, and then we can have a queue and a brainstorming among the speakers. Um, as we know that uh, 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 for 2025, uh, there will be a massive uh, development in, in the 5G for sure. Uh, it's a continuous of uh, 2024. And um, we could able to see that's a various different uh, aspects of, uh, I would say, monetization models, strategies. And uh, I would like to actually uh, uh, seek this uh, speaker's opinion on what you can see the most promising 5G monetization models or, uh, uh, for 2025. Maybe I could be able to start first uh, from my point of view. I think that some of the areas, like for example, age computing is something that's really positive. And, um, and I could be able to see that uh, GPU as a service is really something is going to take off. Um, like uh, for example, Singtel and South Korea Telecom have started coming out with this uh, GPU as a service model. A uh, lots of partnerships is taking on with NVIDIA on the uh, GPU uh, platforms, partnerships together with the telcos. Um, the AI and 5G powered partnerships is another area. A, a lot of tremendous developments in the AI um, in the industry. Uh, I think quite a number of speakers have actually explained. Uh, Srija, you have mentioned as well. So I think AI in the manufacturing, there's a lot of developments is taking on. Um, large language model is something that's really favored nowadays, uh, you know, by the big hyperscalers and the telcos are following the same track. Uh, small language models is another trend is coming up as well. Uh, Multi-party monetization is another area of uh, partnerships of different players in the ecosystems. It can be the mobile network operator, hyperscalers, the enterprises, the startups, um, um, other smaller players, how they can able to work together to come up with those multi-party monetization. Value-added service is another key areas, like for example, uh, cloud gaming, uh, uh, the satellite services is another promising from 23 to 2027 20, because of the convergence between the uh, mobile network and the satellite. There's a, there's a lot of things that are coming up uh, in the low Earth orbit uh, section. Um, AR, VR, extended reality is another value-add service we could able to see. Enhanced mobile broadband is very much related to videos. Huge number of players of videos involved. Um, network as a service is another area where you know you uh, telcos together partnership with other ecosystem players how they can sub uh, sell the bandwidth or even the connectivity for example network slicing is still very slow but hopefully we can see more developments in network slicing because the 5G standalone deployments um, it's still in the slow take I think there's only 50 almost 50 commercial uh, stand alone uh, deployments has been done. Uh, how we can foresee 2025, there will be more take-ups. This is another question. So uh, so I think that is from my point of view. So uh, I'm leaving it to the floor. Uh, please yeah. feel free, uh, share your opinion. Thomas? Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe let me start with the demarcation. So looking at 25, I don't expect the, amongst the hype around generative AI, so much payback and return on investment on 
um, specific use cases being developed here with large language models and so like. Um, again, it's um, there are some some valid areas, for instance, incident management, um, service management, um, where you probably get a kind of different sources with um, any kinds of data being exchanged from from humans. So documents, emails. Um, voicemails, um, what other, which could be certain kinds of language models. However, the, the payback in other areas is not happening next year, probably until the end of the decade, my expectation. This is coming from the fact that right now um, the the research and the piloting and prototyping in that area is going on and um, Amongst the expectation of exec and, and management and investors, um, the the return isn't reached yet. Um, depending on high infrastructure costs, um, electricity consumptions, or or uh, computing power requirements to to generate the models, small, large, X, um, so to speak. Um, and this was my just intro for the floor. Um, please feel free to uh, to speak again. Well, um, Anesh from a and team from from a um, operator perspective, we need to get to new revenues, and we need to build five G, and we need to implement AI, and that's all like you know demands of strategy from the board seeing going forward because we want those highly automated networks which can do zero touch and, and what have you but if we don't have that like financial case beyond it it's not going to happen at all so thinking beyond connectivity working with financial people and strategy people on the same language on how that can be done because the, we first need to have the dip of the outcome or, or the like expense and then and all the technologies showed here today, and they're very impressive. Huh? So industrial manufacturing, security, what have you. These are very transformative use cases for 5G, right? Because now the cloud comes together with a virtualized stack, comes together with an open antenna. But we need to explain this to the world who is not there with us yet in buildings, in transport. And we see it a little bit in electric cars. Like a single use for an electric car is stupid. It's like straight stupid because it's the most connected vehicle I have out there. So make that please a shared vehicle in a metro city center because it delivers on a better transport need. It delivers on a better end need. It delivers on a better ESG mode. And then if you start to use AI to, to Thomas's his opening gambit is you better be double sure because it's very expensive. So if it's not going to be transformative, if I not have a very big asset, like I'm working with offshore wind, it doesn't get more expensive, right? So if you implement offshore wind for like network connectivity, that makes sense. But if I'm going to just use it for my back office, I don't think it's going to work. Anyone wants to add? Yeah, I think I can quickly add on GPU as a service because this has been quite demanding in the universities around Australia and even around US. Uh, I even have a talk with uh, some of the research scientists in the Meta as well. Meta has already like invested millions, billions of dollars in, in establishing their GPU labs. But in terms of like energy crisis, in terms of electricity, which can drive those GPUs has been quite challenging for them as well. And especially for education sector like universities, uh, building a network of GPUs on our own is, is next to impossible because of the cost, price, energy, and then kind of, I mean, maintenance. So we are going into a GPU as a service. For example, I can give you examples of Melbourne Uni, Deccan Uni. What we have been doing is we have been hiring a lot of Amazon brackets, a lot of Google Colabs as a service. And, and we have recently moved, moved even towards Alibaba Cloud as well. So there has been 
a lot of moves in terms of research as well. If you want to test anything, develop a proof of concept or prototype, or even for a pilot project, uh, even if you want to train your small language model, if you even if you want to fine tune your large language model for your specific scenarios, for example, my for for one of my course or unit in the universities or a kind of more research uh, problem in multiple TCP that I just explained. We cannot do it in in-house. We definitely have to offload it into any cost effective and efficient and and and, and time uh I'll say I mean very uh sensitive to research in, in terms of research as well. And and when the move even in our lab now towards quantum message learning, it's it's a bizarre. You can't run your quantum machine learning course in Google Colab's GPUs, even if you purchase their Max. We have recently contacted even IBM, and IBM do have some of the quantum resources available, but in terms of executing the codes, we have to go for a very long waiting queue. So they're not only, I'm not thinking only of GPU as a service, but there could be a very big demand of quantum machines, quantum computers as a service. Like what we have for GPUs, or, or earlier we have Colab, and now we are going for GPUs and network of GPUs, and then moving further, it should be something like, see, for example, we want to have uh, insights between sender and receiver as, as an example. I give an example of semantic communication networks and vehicles, right? If a vehicles needs to talk with each other, understand each other, and understand the road dynamics, and then and then work in a fleet, they need everything instantly. It should happen in zero delay. So there should be a big knowledge driven system that should be installed in our car that should have an, a, a kind of closed ecosystem or closed loop that can operate in, in zero delay. So there we need a kind of, I mean, quantum clouds as a service where a vehicle can quickly connect with the quantum cloud, nearest quantum cloud, and get all the insights and information in real time, right? So it still happen in a fraction of time, seconds in some way. And it is possible, given the technology, it is feasible. So why not we, we move to so quantum computers as a service, quantum networks as a service, not only GPU or network of GPU, but more tools. Quantum, which can speed up everything, like, starting from DNA analysis, genomic analysis, towards real-time operations of the satellites and then autonomous vehicles on the road. And this is all from my. Thank you, Kanesh. And thank you, everyone. Anyone else wants to add? Yes, Kiwi. Maybe a few comments from our sector and um, progress that has been made. Uh, most of the pathway deployments have been 4G advanced, but some of those that are more advanced, for instance, AT TNT FirstNet with FirstNet Authority in the US is next looking at enabling 5G core um, to enable additional 5G services to be delivered to first responders and government agencies. Um, we're seeing um, in private use cases, mining, and some other ports and airports, um, certainly deployment of private 4G um, and in an increasing amount, uh, sorry, 4G um, advanced, but 5G is now starting to take place in some of these. And in, in certain situations, the mobile network operators are actually delivering that capability um, as a service to those uh, in those private environments. Um, and, and interconnecting back into their their main RAN MNO. So that's one area of monetization. I think we'll see some increases in that. Um, spectrum access is, is critical to some of that. Uh, certainly, there's been some pilots around 5G slicing into our sector. Um, and as mentioned before, I think it's uh, uh, standalone networks um, increase then convergence from some of our sector will possibly occur um, at that point in time. So, um, and then there's the applications layer that need to support um, our particular industries. Um, and given that 
Um, in a number of nations, they aren't in a position to deliver a dedicated network, cost, economic, spectrum access. Many are relying on mobile network operators to deliver that capability. Um, so there's a trend in that direction. And I think, you know, when you look at Asia Pacific, whether you look what's going on in Europe, in, in um, nations there and the pan-European EU critical comm service that's, uh, that's now um, getting traction, um, yeah, we will see some of this uh, monetization possible in the in the government and critical industry sectors. And then you can look at the applications and the specialist applications that we'll need to support those particular enterprises, critical mission critical enterprises. Uh, Kevin, maybe I have missed out in your presentation earlier. Um, it, something that is really popped in my mind is the FRMCS. As far as I know, at least four or five years, uh, there was a lot of uh, discussions going on in FRMCS. Um, uh, in the rail sector, right? Um, do you do you foresee there's a lot of developments in the uh, most of the regions who wants to convert from the traditional e GSM towards to the FRMCS? Yeah, look, um, most are going to be forced in that direction with the end of life of technology for GSMR. So there's a huge effort to try and um, uh, commercialize. Um, FRMCS and and continue to finish the uh, the phases of um, 3GPP specification. Um, so you know there's a lot of work in the Etsy plug test going on around FRMCS. They you know we we're, we're hoping to see you know commercialization of that you know occur from 2027 on. There's trials and and so on going on. So there's a huge rail network across the world using GSMR. So, you know, they need a forward um, position and, and FRMCS is the direction it's heading. You know, in the interim, we're seeing metros that are being built that are having to deploy an LTE based or a narrow band like Tetra um, while FRMCS becomes a, you know, a commercial reality and, you know, tested through all of the, you know, the safety systems that are required when you're looking at using connectivity to control a driverless train. <laughs> so I think, you know, a lot of the concepts from the, yeah, the autonomous vehicles and all of this is are going to play space, uh, um, be important around uh, this whole transport market and particularly the rail. Uh, this is a huge market that's got to get replaced over the next uh, 10 or 15 years and, and sooner rather than later. Anyone else have any to say? I'm just supporting it, like, you know, seeing the same, Kevin. So um, the likes of Hitachi and Siemens, they're looking at new rail technologies, uh, better passenger, um, but also autonomous. Like if you look in the harbor areas, 5G harbor areas, very interesting to your point. And of course, what we heard today on 5G um, industrial manufacturing, absolutely uh, video in and you see also multiples. I'm using this in my factory, in my harbor for multiple scanning who's on site. Are they using their security helmets? Like helping a global supply chain, what have you, right? So you have a multiple going on there. And there's high investment uh, interest. And the Chinese railways, they just um, last year um, operated their service in the very high speed trains. So you have 5G in very high speed to great Great, like you know, support of the clients or the passengers on the train who buy all those packages. Right. Yeah, Kanesh, as you know, there's some quite you know useful information that GSMA APAC has inside their um, you know five G industry um, alliance group that you know many of our, our uh, associations uh, are supporting. So, you know, I think there's some really interesting. Um, uh, you have five G deployments. I mean, you go from Hong Kong airport to you know some ports and and you know others like China Mobile have done through the region as as just mentioned. So some really useful uh, useful um, um, programs that and pathfinding projects that I think are you know are going to be the way forward um, across the world. And and maybe connecting to Shiva's point, what you made before is like I need access to this infrastructure. So on my opening slide, I say, how do you go from a project to a product to a platform? And Shiva is learning to that platform. So how can we have GPU, CPU, quantum platforms that multiple parties can use with maybe some like government funding 
uh, we see this happening in the, in the Middle East a lot, that the government is having strategic plans in Asia a lot and the, in the European part, because you don't want to be the last one on, on the bus, like, you know, getting to quantum. And especially if you talk about quantum security. Yeah? So this is very important for our um, national networks. And therefore, we as operator or in the telecom industry, we need to see that 5G is also a very big like opportunity for operators to go to their government and say, hey, you're investing me as a sovereign wealth fund. How about that critical quantum infrastructure that you need to have, right? Because you don't want to leave it to the big players because that gets very expensive. And how is, mm. how is your access to chips, right? In Germany, we have a problem. How do we get access to chips? Uh, Intel just canceled its own factory. So how do you get your own supply chain going, right? Um, yeah. Very important. Yeah, just I final think... words for me. Um, I echo what the um, previous speakers mentioned regarding 5G um, private network deployments, um, the adaptation, especially for industrial use cases. So this needs to be, and this will be a driver of 5G deployments, um, campus networks, no doubt. Um, in case um, users uh, fear the, the, the entry level costs for setting up private networks, yeah. Um, consider about trialing this in public networks like AWS, Wavelength Sound, and the likes. Yeah, we're um, um, allowing you for just um, um, click deployment on the standard AWS user experience with Verizon, the US, and Vodafone across Europe to evaluate um, low latency computing capabilities with multi edge compute nodes, regional um, data centers close to some um, some assets some device, um, also still public, but um, it is um, a test bed and entry level for letting you leverage these kinds of um, uh, private network deployments before uh, doing the full investment. Uh, how about the non-terrestrial networks? Uh, I think uh, there's a lot of uh, 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 tests has been done on the low earth orbit, uh, Ocean and uh, and uh, I I I mean uh, like like Starlink have started to offer those kind of uh, um, satellite services, which is uh, not yet. I mean, there's still a trial on ongoing uh, for the mobile perspective. Uh, but well, I mean, my my opinion, I think there's a lot more to talk, to discuss uh, be, uh, between the mobile. Uh, network operators together with the satellite operators because uh, both of them are still uh, not based on my thought is still not have really came together uh, because it may take a couple of years I think that is what the WRC uh, 2027 we can foresee the, the, the convergence uh, of the two satellite players and mobile network players uh, to see more growth to work together on the end to end perspective. Anyone wants to give some opinion? Um, I'll add to that, if I may, may just start with, certainly our um, emergency um, service community is looking really closely at, at this, particularly in, in rural settings where they don't have terrestrial networks or limited coverage. Um, and even as a, a um, a method of redundancy, even in cases where they may have terrestrial broadband or narrowband access. And we're seeing some of the operators now looking with the governments at how they're packaging that up to at least be able to deliver that capability in the absence of having other mission critical capability, particularly in a disaster response um, um, situation. This is becoming more and more common. And also in, in terms of quick deployable solutions that can provide connectivity where everything else is is wiped out. And governments seem to be investing quite heavily in a number of regions and having this um, quick deployment capability in some regions that's being provisioned with the government network operator or their, their MNO partner. Um, you're seeing that in FirstNet, you're seeing it in Finland, you're seeing the resources being built up in UK, in, in Spain, and in France around the same sort of um, requirement. Um, All right. And, yeah. 
So as, a, uh, as the representative of the space agency, we also uh, has the, you know, uh, some frequencies that is going uh, already going to allocate for 5G operation. So we do also have a satellite that uh, we are currently using C-band. And as you mentioned in the last WRC, some of uh, portion of C-band is already allocated for 5G. And what's our view on that? We also agree to give these frequencies to the mobile operator, operators because uh, I believe that working together with, uh, you know, 5G mobile uh, operators and uh, satellite is important for improving internet access, as well as satellites can reach remote areas where it is hard to build regular networks and they can help connect 5G towers uh, to the main network. So I believe we will uh, we will find the solution in the future, uh, the between satellite operators and uh, you know the uh, terrestrial uh, operators. That's my point. Oh. Yeah, I think today also the point was made on agriculture, agricultural centers. Uh, that's also a big use case um, for the um, better use of soil and water irrigation. And of course, climate change events. So just what Kevin said, like emergency, getting very quickly a 5G mobile antenna with a satellite connection into a disaster area. If your complete network is down, you want to get that satellite connection, move that box in and get for first responder uh, very quickly out there. I think that's a big use. And then defense, defense is a huge use case, right? So yeah, military operations, we see that a lot. And mining, mining is another satellite use case. Marcus, you have anything to say? Uh, well, like, I was listening and I agree with most of uh, what you like, said. I was like thinking of smart vehicles, infrastructure, when you mentioned about the um, uh, 5G monetization. Uh, and uh, the use in agriculture is also uh, a must. It will happen for sure. Um, yeah, so basically, uh, I agree with what you've all said. And uh, I support all these, uh, all the comments. Srija? For, for me, it is a lot of learning. <clears throat> Coming from the manufacturing side, I, I don't really know much about how 5G is progressing and all that. I know that if it is existing and if we have fast network connections, that's definitely very useful for us. And that's going to change a lot for us. But I, I really did not know how it is changing and all that. This, these are so many interesting insights, and um, I learned quite a lot today. To be very honest, uh, uh, honestly speaking, uh, based on my previous <clears throat> session, uh, when it comes to the uh, uh, development of a five G, real five G, obviously the standalones were still, still, you know, uh, not up to the par yet. So mobile network operators are still doing the waiting games. But obviously, the 5G private network really took off very well. And those private networks mainly in the manufacturing sector. And Germany, one of those who actually was leading in the uh, uh, private networks, uh, particularly in the manufacturing se sector, uh, followed like uh, Japan uh, and uh, South Korea and even China also. Uh, uh, and, and all of them were really focusing the uh, uh, manufacturing sector. So I think because private 5G was very straightforward, not much of complexity is easy to be deployed for specific purpose uh, for the larger uh, manufacturer perspective. So I think I think that is really taking off very well from for private network point of view. At least. So I think the other areas, I think uh, uh, mobile telco, mobile network operators still have to, uh, you know, speed up themselves uh, rather than just waiting the non stand alone uh, by being uh, playing safe, you know, uh, they should actually uh, start to uh, consider uh, deploying the standalones as well. Yeah, I definitely Can second I that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, um, at least in the manufacturing sector, no one wants to upload the uh, data to the public networks, and they would definitely prefer having their own network and then developing or using that on their own. So yes, that that will be. Uh, I mean, we can see so many industries opting that path. We have seen Airbus opting that already and i'm pretty sure they they have uh, already you know implemented it in another planet plant in hamburg in germany as well so i'm pretty sure many other industries as well will be up, opting for that quite soon i think we we hang it on the head now like now we have an industry telecom conversation going on that's exactly what needs to happen yes 
Yes. You need to understand where can I put it? Where is my ultra light laser sharp delivery tomorrow? Like, you know, don't talk too much tech to me. I want my machines running. I want to change over my lines. I want my CFO to be happy, not being like breathing down my back. If your tech can help me, nice. If not, no. And if it's yeah. going to cost me a lot, tell me how. Right? Exactly. Like, uh, how much do you need? How how much space do you need? And what are your yeah. needs? And this is what I need. Those are the conversations which will change mm -hmm. the, like, that will be the perfect collaboration between 5G and manufacturing, I guess. That this is what I need. Can you give that to us or not? That's it. <laughs> And then we call Kevin to see how we get it secure, right? Because we want to. Yeah. From my other thing, you know, across the list. world is ensuring private spectrum is made um, equitable, accessible spectrum. Because without that, um, it's it's going to be very difficult in some nations to drive the uh, industrial and and you know, sectors like resources and and so on. All right, I think this is one of the longest uh, time that took place more than 30 minutes Q&A, fantastic. And uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate and so grateful to all of you. Um, this uh, video will be uploaded on our YouTube channel in, in the next uh, an hour or two hours so. And we will be promoting each of the speakers uh, on our uh, LinkedIn page and we will promote uh, via our newsletter as well. Uh, and uh, and I really uh, uh, hope, anticipate to see more viewership on our YouTube channel, particularly in this session as well. So thank you so much. I really appreciate. Um, have a great day and have a great week. And until uh, then, see you. Thank, thank you. you thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ganesh. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.